Hey everyone, Cody from Mac Telecom Networks. The time has finally come to do the complete Unify setup for 2023. I did a complete Unify setup for 2022 and people have been requesting a new one. A lot has changed in this new user interface and the Unify OS that we'll be using is 3.1.16. As of this video, that is the general release version and the Unify network version we'll be using is 7.5.172. There's going to be a lot of information in this video, so I will put timestamps down below and you could go between what you want to watch. What you're going to see in this video is the initial setup of our Unify console. We're going to do Wi-Fi networks, we're going to do VLANs, we're going to do internet settings, PNs, threat management, and firewall rules, and a whole lot more. If you'd like to hire me for network consulting, visit my website at MacTelecomNetworks.com. If you want to become part of the community even more, we do have a Discord server and affiliate links down in the description below. First off, we're going to take a look at some of the devices that Ubiquiti offers, and we're really going to be using the Unify OS consoles. I'm using a UDM SE. You may be using a UDM Pro, a Dreamwall, or a Dream Router, or their base model of the UDM. You could also be using a CloudKey Gen 2 with a USG or a USG Pro but these do have limitations. So I'm not gonna go into too deep of details of what they can and can't do. The UDM Pro and the UDM SE pretty much could do the same things. Same with the Dream Wall. The Dream Router is limited when you put on threat management to 750 megabits per second or roughly around there. You also need to take into consideration switches that you're gonna be using. If you have a lot of PoE devices, you're probably gonna to want to go with the professional PoE models. If we look at the standard PoE model, it only has 95 watts. If we look at the professional ones, it has 400 watts and it does PoE across all 24 ports. The standard PoE only does it across 16. It's always better to allow yourself more wattage in your budget so that you don't overload your switches. Another difference between the professional switches and the standard switches, the professional come with SFP plus ports and these are 10 gigabit ports. The standard switches only have one gigabit ports, which would be uplinking to other switches or to your Unify console. The next thing you'd want to look at is Wi-Fi access points and Ubiquiti has a ton of them. My go-to for installations is the Unify U6 Professional. The reason why, it has Wi-Fi 6 on the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz. If you get something like the U6 LR, it only has Wi-Fi 6 on the 5 gigahertz. They also do give you a couple outdoor options if you want to capture maybe some outdoor Wi-Fi for your pool area or something like that. They have the AC Mesh, the U6 Mesh, and the AC Mesh Professional. The U6 LR does have an IP rating, for outdoor weatherproofing. Now I'm not gonna go over any more gear as that's a whole topic by itself. We're gonna take a look at what my network setup is. So I do have this diagram right here and you can see that I have the UDM SE up on the top. And going into my UDM SE, I have two internet providers. One is one gigabit by 40 megabits per second and the other is three gig by three gig and that's my primary ISP. Below that, the UDM SE is connecting to my aggregation switch pro and this is pretty much all overkill for my home network because I do reviews on this. You most likely won't need an aggregation switch in your house, but if you are going over one or two switches, it may be a good idea. Ubiquiti does offer a USW aggregation that is only eight ports and it's not as costly as this aggregation pro. Now all of my other switches are plugged into the aggregation pro. We have my USW enterprise PoE 24 port. We have this mission critical switch, which is great because it has a battery built into it. And you would want to use this for door access as it has four PoE plus plus ports. Next beside that, we have my RPS, which is a redundant power supply. This isn't a UPS and a lot of people get confused. They think it's a UPS, but it has no battery in it. If your power goes out, this will go out as well. The reason we want this is to have a secondary power supply in our UDM Pro or our UDM SE. They do use these proprietary cables, which is shown on the screen. I also do have a PDU Pro that's plugged into my aggregation switch as well. Then below that, we have all my devices hanging off of it. The access points that I'm using in my living room is the U6 Enterprise in wall. And then in this office, I'm using the U6 Enterprise. We'd see these USW flex switches, which are actually powered up by the Mission Critical on PoE++, and these have cameras hanging off of it in my garage and in my catio. Now these are the different networks that we're gonna be creating. My default will be 192.168.10.1 slash 24 and it won't have any Wi-Fi network. This will have all my Ubiquiti gear on it as well as my Synology NAS. Then we have my IoT network at 192.168.20.1 
and it will have a Wi-Fi network called Dolores. We're going to have a camera network at 192.168.30.1, and it will be called Mac Telecom Camera. And then we'll have guest at 192.168.40.1, and it will be called Mac Telecom Guest. Now, the next thing that I need to do is reset all of my devices, and then we'll start with the initial setup. Now, my UDM SE has been totally reset, same with all of my devices. To be able to start the initial setup, we need to go to unify slash or to the IP address, and the default is 192. 1681.1. And now you can see the UDMSE showing up on the screen to do the initial setup. It's saying we're committed to securing your data and protecting your privacy. I'm going to say set up UDMSE. Now it's asking us to put in a console name. You could leave it at UDMSE. I'm going to call it Mac Telecom SE. I'm going to agree to the terms and service and then we're going to press next. The next step, it's asking you to sign in to their website at ui.com using our single sign on. This would allow us to manage multiple different Unify consoles using unify.ui.com. If you don't want to do that, you could set up a local account. I'm going to sign in to my Unify account. I ended up skipping the speed test, but for this connection, I guess in the WAN 1 port, I have my Rogers, which is 1000 by 40, and that's what I'm going to tell the UDMSE, and we'll press next. Now, this is something new that I've never seen before. It says default IP change. We have detected an already configured network subnet mask at 192. 168.10.1. Do you want to use the existing one or set it up manually? I'm just going to use the existing one and press finish. Now the initial setup is done and we're on the Unify dashboard. Under the Mac Telecom SE, we could see my WAN IPs for WAN 1, WAN 2, and then we could see the gateway IP at 192.168.10.1. We could also see the system uptime and we could see the different WAN connections and do speed test on them. We can see traffic identification, but there's no traffic as of yet because this is a brand new setup, most active access point, client types, and most active clients, which there really isn't anything because we haven't adopted anything. So next I need to get my devices adopted and then Wi-Fi connected so I could turn my lights back on in this office. We're going to want to go over to Unify Devices. Next, we could see everything that's ready to be adopted, which there's seven. We do have a couple more that are missing. I'm going to have to go physically reset those. But to adopt them, all we need to do is click here. If a device isn't adopted into your controller, you won't be able to do any configuration on it. That's why the adoption process is so important. Now we need to go set up our networks and our Wi-Fi networks. And how we do that, we go over to the settings wheel on the left-hand side. But before that, I'm going to switch my console to dark mode so it's a little easier on the eyes. We go down to system, and then you can see the theme here. We either have dark or light. I'm going to click on dark, and we're going to apply those changes. Now we have that done, we need to go up to networks. So looking back at our drawing, the networks that we have is the default, which is already created. The next one we need to do is the IoT. So to create a new network, all we need to do is go to virtual networks and press create new. I'm going to call this network IoT. I'm going to uncheck auto scale. I never leave auto scale on. And we're going to put it to 192.168.20.1 slash 24. So that gives us 249 workable hosts. I'm going to click on manual and then I'm going to select the VLAN ID. You could leave this at whatever you want, but I usually match it to the third octet. So we're going to put it on 20. This isn't going to have isolation and everything else we're going to leave at default. The next network that we need to create is our cameras. I'll create new and we'll call it cameras. I'm going to uncheck the auto scale and it will be 192.168.30.1. Click on manual, switch the VLAN ID to 30 and then we'll press add. And the last network that I need to create is my guest network. So we'll call it guest, uncheck auto scale, and it will be 192.168.40.1. We'll go to manual and it will be 40 VLAN. This time we're gonna select isolation. So if I look over the eye icon, it says your guest hotspot profile will be automatically applied to your guest networks. Connected clients will be isolated from other internal networks. These restrictions can be modified in the guest hotspot profile. We also won't be using the guest hotspot profile. That's something like a captive portal and we won't be doing that in this video. And then I'm gonna press add. Now, just going back to the guest network, if we want to put some basic content filters on it, we could do that. We have content filters right here and there's a couple that you could do. You could do none, you could do work, which blocks explicit, pornographic and malicious domains, search engines and YouTube in safe mode. And then we have family, which really just puts YouTube in safe mode as well and then blocks VPNs. 
I'm going to put this to work and then press apply changes. Now our networks are created. The next thing we need to do is create Wi-Fi networks and we'll click on Wi-Fi networks. And the first one will be our IOT network, which I call Dolores. We need to put in a password of a minimum of eight characters. So I'm going to do that. Now under network, we don't want this to be on our default. We click the drop down arrow and we're going to put it on IOT or whatever one you want it to connect to. If you have multiple different access points, you could tell this Wi-Fi network which one to be on. By default, it will grab all the access points and push it to it. But we do have this broadcasting APs and we could create different groups. We have advanced and then under manual, you could do the hotspot portal. You'd select which bands it's working on. So the 2.4, the 5 or the 6 gigahertz. The only ones that have Wi-Fi 6E right now, the access points, are the U6 Enterprise and the U6 Enterprise in wall. We have different Wi-Fi features like band steering. And if we scroll down even more, we could do multicast enhancement, multicast and broadcast control, and we could set our security protocol. So we have WPA2, WPA2 Enterprise, which would use a radius server using username and password. And then we have WPA3. The problem with WPA3, some devices don't like it and they will never connect. Now for this Wi-Fi network, I'm just going to press add Wi-Fi. And if we go over to our devices, you should see that these are getting ready. They are starting to grab that configuration that we just did. Now the access points have grabbed that Wi-Fi name. You can see a bunch of my clients are starting to come on on the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz. That's because I put in the same SSID and password. Now we have to go ahead and we need to make a couple other Wi-Fi networks. The next network that we'll make is our camera network. I'm going to create new and call it Mac Telecom Camera. And we're going to give it a password. Under the network, this time we're going to put it to the cameras and we're going to add the Wi-Fi network. Now the last Wi-Fi network we need to create is the guest and I'm going to call it Mac Telecom Guest. And we'll give it a password as well. This time we'll put the network as the guest. Under manual, we're not going to have the hotspot portal on. I'm going to turn that off and we're going to want to give the guest a Wi-Fi limit. I don't want them using up all my bandwidth. So we could see Wi-Fi QoS. I'm going to click on that. It says bandwidth limits can be imposed if you've created at least one profile. So looking down, we don't have any profiles created. I'm going to create a new profile. I'm going to call this profile guest and we'll give them 10 up and 10 down. And then we're going to apply the changes. Now, if we click back on that Wi-Fi QoS, we should see that profile, which we do is the guest. And we're going to add the Wi-Fi network. Now, at this point, we have your networks and your Wi-Fi networks set up. There are a couple things that you could do to optimize it. And I'm not going to go super in depth on that, but I will show you a few things. If you're looking for your Wi-Fi speeds to be a little bit quicker, you could bump up the channel width on the 5 gigahertz to 80. This does introduce some interference if you have neighbors all around you. I do live in a subdivision and there would be lots of access points around me. One other thing, if you don't have any wireless uplinking devices, you could turn off wireless meshing, which I will do. So something like the Beacon HD or the U6 extender, that is a Wi-Fi meshing device. Another thing we could do on the access points is set the channels manually. So if we go over to settings, you're going to see this is managed by Global IP. We could uncheck that and we could uncheck nightly channel optimization. The channel optimization each night, it does a scan of all the channels and sees which one is the least utilized and then picks that. So we're gonna uncheck that. On our 2.4, we only have three channels that are non-overlapping, one, six, and 11. On our five gigahertz, we have a bunch of other channels that we could choose from. If we go over to insights, we could do channel scan. So this would be for the 2.4 and it will fill up whichever one is the most utilized and we could do it for the five gigahertz as well. Most of the time leaving it on default works well, but if you are deploying quite a few access points or have a lot of noisy neighbors around you, you may want to set these manually. With our Wi-Fi created in the networks associated to it, when somebody joins a different network, they get it from a certain subnet. But with our wired networks, we need to actually define that on the switch port. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna put all of these cameras in the camera network. You would see that they're in the 192.168.10 network. The one camera that is in the correct subnet is my doorbell because it had the same Wi-Fi SSID in the password. That's why it's getting the 30. The first one I'm going to change is my UMBR. If we click on the UMBR, you could see it's on port 20 on the aggregation switch. So we're going to go up to our ports, then we'll go to port manager. By default, how Ubiquiti does their ports, they are like trunk ports. So they allow every single VLAN to go down it. So we're going to want to find port 20, which is my UMVR. Click on that port. We could see that it's active 
and the network currently is our default. I'll hit the drop down arrow and we'll go to cameras. Once that's done, we'll just press apply changes. Now we need to find all of my other cameras on my switches and then do the same. So I'll go to my USW Enterprise 24 PoE. We'll go to ports, port manager, and we could see that I have two G3 flexes on here. So I'll click both of them and we'll switch the network and we'll put it on the camera network and apply the changes and press confirm. With my cameras, since they're a PoE device, I usually do a power cycle. We only could do one at a time though. So I'll click on port three and we'll do a power cycle and we'll press confirm. Then we'll do the same on port six. The other cameras are living on my USW flex switches. So let's go over to those switches, go to port manager and we'll select on the three cameras, go to the primary network and put it into the camera network and then apply the changes. We'll press confirm and then I'm gonna power cycle each one of these. Now, after switching all of those ports, you can see my cameras have all gone into the correct subnet of 192.168.30.x. There is one more thing to touch on about port profiles. So if I click on my USW24, and then we just click on some random port, they do now have this traffic restriction. I don't typically use it too much, but if we look over the eye icon, it says when enabled, you can allow or block specific virtual network traffic through this port. When we turn it on, you could either block everything or you could allow everything. We're gonna do our blocking between subnets within our firewall rules. Next, we're gonna look at our internet. So we'll go to settings and we'll click on internet. At the top, we could see our primary WAN and then our secondary WAN. If we want to set a specific DNS for this, we'd have to go to manual. Under DNS server, we're gonna uncheck auto and we're gonna put in our own servers. I'm just gonna do 1.1.1.1 and 8.8.8.8. If your ISP requires you to put a VLAN, that's where you could do it. You could do MAC address cloning and you could also switch it from DHCP to be static or PPPoE. I don't have either, I'm just gonna leave it at DHCP. Also under our internet, we have these internet sources. So we could make any one of these four ports a WAN port. So if we wanted port eight to be WAN two, we would just need to specify that. We also have two different types of load balancing. One is just failover. So if WAN one goes down, WAN two will pick up. The other is distributed. I usually don't work with the distributed one unless you're having the exact same speed. So one gig by one gig on both lines, and then we could set it to 50%. At that point, you're gonna have one packet go down WAN one and then one down WAN two. This next section is gonna be about our firewall. So by default, Ubiquity allows every single network to talk to each other. When you say network isolation for our guest network, it automatically creates firewall rules for us, as you can see here, but everything else is allowed to talk to one another. Now, before we get into the firewall rules, we're gonna quickly go over what the WAN local, WAN in and WAN out, same with the LAN local in and out. They are really the same, but just on different interfaces. And this is from a post about three years ago, but it still is the same way. So the WAN local applies to IP traffic that is destined for the UDM itself on the WAN network. And the default state is to drop that. The WAN in applies to the IPv4 traffic that is ingress and it's destined for other networks and the default is to drop. And the WAN out is for the egress, so leaving your network and the default is to accept. The same thing goes for your LAN network. So we have our LAN local. The LAN local is pointing towards our gateway IP, so the UDM itself and we have a default of accept. All of our LAN rules, the default is accept. That's why we have to put that RFC 1918 inner VLAN blocking rule in. The LAN in applies to the traffic that enters the LAN ingress, so destined for other networks. So this is our inner VLAN routing. And then the LAN out would be something like for our VPNs. I'll probably do a separate full video on this with diagrams once I build those diagrams to explain it a little bit better because it's very hard for some people to understand. So the first rule that I put in, we create an entry. We want it to be our LAN in. So that's our communication between our VLANs. And I call it allow established and related. So what this does in my head anyway, if the default network talks to the IoT network, the IoT network is allowed to talk back to the default. So we're gonna leave it at any any. You could lock this down even more. You could say the source is default and the destination is IoT or whatever you wanna do. But for this video, we'll do any any. And then we need to scroll down to advanced and go manual. And we need to match state established and match state related and press apply changes. Now the allow established and related is very important for your IOT network because we will have a block inner VLAN routing rule here shortly. So I'm gonna create a new entry. 
The next one, the type will still be land in and it will be called drop in valid state. The action is going to be to drop and then we're going to do any, any again, scroll down, go to manual and then we'll match state invalid and we'll press apply changes. The next step we need to do is to create a profile. We're going to go to profiles and IP groups. IP groups, we're going to create new. Here, I'm going to call this RFC 1918 and that's your request for comments 1918, which is a white paper based on IPv4 addresses in the private space. The type is going to be IPv4 address subnet and the first one will be 192. 168.0.0 slash 16. The second one will be 172.16.0.0 slash 12. And the last one will be 10.0.0.0 slash 8. We'll press add and then apply changes. Now going back to our firewall rules, we're going to create another entry and it's again under our LAN in. This time we're going to say allow the default network to all VLANs. We need to have our default network to talk to everything because that's where our Ubiquity gear sits. The action is going to be accept. The source will be a network of our default and the destination will be that new group. So that allows the default to talk to every single private IPv4 address. Now this next rule will to be block inner VLAN routing. So our cameras won't be able to see the IoT, the IoT won't be able to see our cameras or the default network and so on and so forth. So we'll create a new rule it's going to be done under LAN in and it will be called block inner VLAN routing. The action is going to be to drop and the source will be a port IP group and it will be RFC 1918 and the destination will be the same thing. So we're blocking private subnets from private subnets and we'll apply the changes. Now I'm going to put this computer onto my camera network and we shouldn't be able to hit any of the devices that are on my default network here. You can now see that this computer is on 192.168.30.195 which is my camera network and if we try to ping my RPS which is on 10.190 we shouldn't be able to. I'll type in ping 192.168.10.190. And you can see that the requests are timing out. But what happens if, say, our camera network has to reach my Synology NAS? Well, we'll put an allow rule in for that, and I'll show you now. Going back to our settings and then firewall and security, we're going to create a new entry. We're going to do it in LAN in, and this will be to allow our cameras to NAS. The source is going to be our network of our cameras, and the destination, I'm just going to have it as an IP address. The IP of my NAS is 192. 168.10.220. We're going to apply the changes and then we need to reorder the rules. So under our LAN, we could see this block inner VLAN routing and then we have our allow cameras to NAS. Well, this goes top down in order. So once it hits the blocking rule, it's going to stop and we would never be able to reach the NAS. So all we need to do is drag and drop that above the block rule and we should be good. And now opening up a command prompt, if we do ping 192.168.10.220, we are able to hit my Synology NAS. Now we have some base firewall rules in. We have inner VLAN routing blocked, and we also allow our cameras to our NAS. I put this computer on my IoT network, and we shouldn't be able to hit any other network. But if we try to ping our gateway or go to our gateway, we're still going to be able to hit that. So we're going to have to block that off. So our gateway for our IoT network is 192.168.20.1. And I'm doing that in the web browser. You'd see that the suspicious page blocked from protection and it's coming up at 20.1. If we understand the risk, it's going to bring us to our UDM gateway. And you can see there we are now at the Mac Telecom SE. So especially for our IoT network, we don't want that to be able to get to our gateway. Maybe our cameras as well. If you're using Unify Protect, on your UDM console, you're not going to want to do this because it will make your remote connection slow and the viewing experience almost unbearable. We also don't want to be able to get to the other gateways. So if we go to 192.168.40.1, you'll see that there. And this is the camera network, but it's still pointing towards our Unify console. So what we need to do, we need to go into our firewall and then create some profiles. Back at my UDM SE, I clicked on the profiles and then I'm going to create a new one. Here I'm going to call it Block IoT. To gateways so what this is going to do we're going to put in all of our ips of every single gateway ip except the iot network so we'll put in 192.168.10.1 we'll put in 192.168.30.1 and then our last one will be our camera network 192.168.40.1 and then we're gonna add that change. Now we have that, we're gonna go to application firewall, go to firewall rules, and then we're gonna create new. 
This time it's going to be done under land local and land local. If you remember at the beginning of the firewall, this is towards our gateway. So what I'm going to call this block IOT to gateways, the action will be to drop. And then the source is going to be a network of our IOT and the destination is going to be the port IP group of the block IOT to gateways. And then we're going to add the rule. Now, if I open up a command prompt, I shouldn't be able to hit the camera gateway at 192.168.40.1. And I can't. Same thing goes if I open up a web browser, so 40.1. So we're not able to get there. But if I do my own gateway still, 192.168.20.1, which is the IoT network, we're still going to be able to hit the OS. What we have to do here, we need to block at the web port. So HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH. So we'll go back to the UDM interface. We'll go to profiles. We'll go to IP groups, and then we'll create a new group. This time it's going to be a port group called HTTP, HTTPS and SSH. The ports we're going to put in is port 80, port 443, and then we're going to put in 22 for SSH and press add. I'm going to create one more group just with the IP of the IoT network. So I'll just call it IoT Gateway. It's going to be an IPv4 in the IP of the gateway, which is 192.168.20.1. Now going back to my firewall rules, we're going to create a new entry. It's still going to be under LAN local. That's because it's still a gateway rule and it will be called block IOT to UDM interface. I'm going to say to drop, that will be the action. The source is still going to be a network of IOT and the destination this time is still a port group, but it will be the IOT gateway, which has that IP address of 192.168.20.1. And then it's going to be that new port group that I created and we'll add the rule. Now with that rule in there, if we go back to the IOT gateway, we shouldn't be able to reach it. And it does look like this website is timing out. And that's the basic firewall rules. Of course, you could do a lot more complex things. You might have Plex opened up or you might have some port forwarding. We're not gonna to touch on that here because there's so many rules in different situations. Another way to block communication between your networks is through traffic rules, and we will take a look at that in a little while. Now, a couple other things that we could do with the application firewall. We do have this ad blocking, but it's very simple. All we do is click it, and then we select the networks that we want to be in there. I'm going to turn that off for now. We could also do country restrictions. So if we turn that on, we could say which countries we don't want to talk to in both directions, outgoing or incoming. I'm just going to pick a couple off the top of my head. China, Russia, maybe we don't want. Uh, you're not gonna wanna block your own country because you won't really get anywhere. Down below under advanced internet filter, we have something called suspicious activity, which used to be their IDS and their IPS solution. So you could either have no action, you could have notify, which just sends you alert, or you could have notify and block. We have our detection sensitivity. You could have it low, medium, or high. On high, it turns on all the toggle switches. If you wanna customize it, you could do that. So if you have a threat come into your network, it's gonna notify and block it if you have notify and block. You could turn all of these on or all of these off, and this is based on Sericata, and you could do a bit more research into that. But we have peer-to-peer, -peer, we have Tor, which is known as the dark web, uh, we have scans, we have denial of service, and then we have some VoIP applications and a bunch more. We also have a dark web blocker, and it says prevent traffic encrypted by Tor from moving through your networks. I'm gonna turn that on, and we also have malicious website blocker. Use Unify real-time database to block IP that are known to be malicious. And I will turn that on and we'll apply the changes. Now, another way you could go about blocking countries on the left-hand side, we have this security insight. Under security insight, we have a traffic monitor and you could see all the different applications or websites that you're reaching and what is using at the time. You could see at September 24th, between nine and 905, I was using Netflix. If we go to filtering activity, this is going to show us what was filtered. So we could see that I had 33,194 things that were blocked and it was this ad block. We could also look at threat blocks. At the time range in the last day, I haven't had any threat blocks and we could look at traffic rules enforced. Now our traffic map, this is going to show us where our UDM is communicating with. So you could see everything that is in blue, that's where it's been talking to. Anything with these gray lines through it, that's who you've blocked. If you wanted to block another country, say Iceland, all we would need to do is click on it and then we could block it. You'd also look at how much traffic is being sent to and from. Now this next section is going to be on the Unify VPNs and there's a few that we're not going to talk about. The L2TP we won't be because that is going to be going away soon. And same with the site to site VPN. We will be talking about the magic site to site VPN 
If you're using something like a PF Sense on the other side and a Unify Firewall, you'd want to use this site-to-site -site VPN. Now, first up is going to be the Teleport, which is the easiest one to set up, but you only could use this on your Android or iOS and you need to download the Wi-Fi Man. So if you want to use it on mobile, that's great. And how we do it, we enable it and you can see this invitation. We need to generate a new link. You'd see here that the link expires in 24 hours, so you could either email this to somebody. If you're using it yourself, you could copy it and you could put it in a web browser. Now we put it into our web browser. It says connect to Mac Telecom SE, and then we have a QR code. All you need to do is open up your camera application on your phone and then go to the QR and it will load it into Wi-Fi Man. The Teleport app is supposed to be coming to Mac OS shortly, and I hope they do bring that to Windows because that would be great. And the back end of it is WireGuard. Now, speaking of WireGuard, we have VPN servers. So these VPN servers would be used for remote workers. We have WireGuard, OpenVPN, and then we have the L2TP. If we click on the L2TP, it says L2TP is traditional VPN that is losing support on several different operating systems. So that's why we're going to be touching on it today. So what we will be doing is the WireGuard and the OpenVPN. The first thing that we need to do is give it a name. I'm going to leave it at my WireGuard server. We have our private key and then we have our public key. We have our server address, which is either going to use your WAN1 or your WAN2 address, and then it tells you the port. We could enter an address manually if we'd like, and now we need to add a client to this. So I'm going to click on add client. Right up at the top, it says multiple WireGuard clients should not share the same VPN configuration. So if you have a bunch of different users, give them their own configuration. We also have auto generate or we have manual and then the client name. I'll just put it to Cody. This is something new that I haven't seen. You could either tap below the download the configuration file or you could scan the QR code. I'm just gonna download the config file. Once we download the config file, we need to press add and then add again for it to save. If you wanted your WireGuard VPN, the local addresses to be something specific, you could change the host address or the subnet here. And you could also tell it which name server to use by clicking enable and then putting in your DNS. Now, just to show you that I can't reach my Synology NAS because I'm not on the same network as my UDMSE, we're gonna ping 192.168.10.220. And you could see that the requests are timing out. We need to download the WireGuard client onto our computer or whatever you're using. If you're using a phone, they do have an application for that. And then we could import tunnels from file. And this file will be saved in my downloads folder. I've now added that file to my WireGuard client. You could see the status, the public key, the address, which is 192.168.3.2, and then the DNS server. Below that, the peer, we could see the public key, the allowed IP addresses, and then the endpoint, which is our public IP of our WAN1. So now I'm gonna activate the WireGuard VPN and connect to it just by clicking activate. We can see the status is active and the last handshake was eight seconds ago. Now, if I go to the command prompt, I should be able to hit my Synology NAS. And you can see that I'm able to get to it. Now the OpenVPN pretty much works the same way. We need to give it a name, the server address and the port, and then we need user authentication. So we're gonna create a new user. Here, I'm going to give it a username of Cody, and then we're going to do a password of test1234 and create the user. Now, under advanced, we could go to manual. We could select a radius profile if we want. We could do a gateway subnet, and below, we could see that subnet information, and we could also specify a DNS server. For this, I'll put it to 1.1.1.1, and then we'll press add. Now, after you've added the VPN, you need to come back into it and download the configuration file. Same thing with WireGuard, we need to have an OpenVPN client. So I'll look for the OpenVPN connect, and then we're gonna go ahead and upload that file. On the file, it shows us a profile name, the server host, and then we have our username. So this is the username that you've added into that configuration. So for me, it was Cody. Once we press connect, it's gonna prompt us for our password. Now, once the password is put in, you could see that I'm connected to that network, and I'm gonna see if I could ping the Synology NAS again. I'll press the up arrow, and you could see that we could hit the NAS. One thing with these VPNs, they have access to everything on the network. So if we go back to my unified devices, you can see my PDU Pro is at 10.142. So let's try to ping that. Ping 192.168.10.142. You may not want this. So what we have to do, we need to implement some firewall rules. The first thing that I do is to create a profile of the VPN subnet. If you don't know where the VPN subnet is, all you need to go to teleport and VPN, 
go to VPN server, click on your open VPN server or your WireGuard. It works the same for both. Scroll down to the bottom and then find your gateway and subnet. For me, it's 192.168.4.0 slash 24. We'll go back to profiles, we'll go to IP groups, and then we're gonna create a new group. This time I'm gonna call this VPN users. The type is gonna be an IPv4 subnet and I'll be putting in 192.168.4.0 slash 24 and we're gonna add that and then we're gonna press add once again. Now we need to go back to our firewall rules. So we'll go to application firewall and we're gonna to go to firewall rules. We're gonna create a new entry and this time the type is gonna be LAN out. For the description, I'm gonna say block VPN users to all subnets. After we do the block rule, we'll end up putting an allow rule just to allow it to go to the Synology NAS. So the action will be to drop. The source is gonna be a port IP group of that new one that we just created, VPN users, and the destination will be that RFC 1918 group that we created earlier that has every single IPv4 address in it. Now I'm gonna add the rule. With that rule added, I shouldn't be able to hit this PDU Pro anymore, so let's give it a try. And as you can see, we're blocked off from hitting the PDU Pro. But if we try to hit my Synology NAS, we're also blocked off from hitting that. So we need to put in an allow rule. Going back to the firewall rules, we're gonna create an entry. It's gonna be the type of LAN out again, and this time we'll say VPN to NAS. The action will be to accept. The port IP group will be VPN users, and then the destination, I'm just gonna put an IP address of my NAS, 192.168.10.220, and we're gonna add the rule. Currently how it sits, the rule won't work. We need to go over to LAN, and then we need to go over to this right here. We could say VPN to NAS is under the block rule, so we need to drag and drop that above. Once we do that, we go back to our command prompt, press up, and we should be able to hit the NAS in a second. And you can see that the replies went through, so that's how we do some basic firewall rules for our VPNs. The next one we have is a VPN client. So say we have something like NordVPN and we want to route a full subnet through it, we could do that. We could give it a description, I'll just call it NordVPN because that's what I use. And I do have an affiliate link down below for Nord. I'm not sponsored by them at all, it's just who I use, trust who you want. Then you need to put the username, the password, and the configuration file from whichever VPN provider that you're using. I have another full video on this, which I will put in the description. So I'm gonna go ahead, put that information in, and then we're gonna test and save. Now that I have all the Nord information in and the config file, we could do the test and save. Okay, so it's showing that it's connected and it's been up for two seconds and we could see this local IP, which is a Nord server. But how do we go about routing a full network over that? Well, I'm gonna show you. So if we go over to networks, I'm gonna create a new virtual network. I'll call this NordVPN. I'll give it an address of 192.168.66.1. And then we'll also give it a VLAN of 66 and we'll add that. Now to route that subnet over it, we need to go over to routing. And this is like policy-based routing. We're gonna to go to the traffic routes, all traffic types, and then we're gonna say on. You could either do this on a device or you could do it on a network. I'm gonna go over to NordVPN. Now under interface, this is where we want to select that new OpenVPN file. So we'll click on there. You'd see primary WAN1, WAN2, or the NordVPN, and then we're gonna add the entry. Now, if you have a Wi-Fi network connected to that subnet, everybody who connects to it will be going through the NordVPN, which is really great. Now, the last VPN type that we need to talk about is the magic site-to-site -site VPN. And this is all done through unify.ui.com and you need to have a couple consoles, at least one with a public IP, and they all need to be on the new Unify OS 3 or above. So looking here, we could see that we have the Site Magic. I'm gonna go ahead and click on there. Under the name, it's telling us Site Magic Group 1, and then it's showing me all of my consoles that are capable of doing Site Magic VPNs. We're just gonna select my Mac Telecom SE, which has a public IP address, and then my mom and Sean's. Now we need to select which subnets we want to be able to communicate. I'm just gonna say 192.168.10.0, my default network on my UDMSE, and then at my mom's, their default at 192.168.1.0. We'll press connect. And once we do, you'll see this going amber, and when it's fully connected, it will be green. We could see that it's now fully connected, and on my mom's site, there is an access point there at 192.168.1.72. So let's try to ping that ping. 192.168.1.72 
and we are able to hit that. Now the same firewall rules apply to the site to site VPNs doing the LAN out firewall rules. So if you need to do that, go back a little bit and implement those. Now that we've done our firewall rules, we could take a look at traffic rules and this kind of works the same way. We have an action which we could block, allow, or we could do speed limits. We have different categories. So this is app where we could block something like Instagram or whatever you want. There are a bunch of different categories. So there's app group would let us block a bunch of social media. We have domain name, IP address, region, and then we have internet and local network. So if you're wanting to block VLAN traffic between certain networks, we could do that. We could specify the local network, we'll say my IoT network, and then we could do the traffic direction. If you don't want them to talk at all, you could do to and from. If you want it to have one-way communication, you can as well. Traffic from all local networks or traffic to all local networks. And then we specify on which device. So we'll say to block to the camera network, but you could also do it on a device, maybe like this PC, and we could put it on a schedule and then a description. So this is really great if you're trying to do more content filtering. Currently, I don't use the traffic rules to do my blocking between my VLANs. I still find the firewall rules easier, but what I will use this for is content filtering. Now, one other thing that you could do with this is wired speed limits, and this will apply to your wireless as well. We already did wireless QoS on our guest network, but that only applies to the Wi-Fi. So if we want to do a speed limit, we could select the category, which is going to be internet, and then we could do our download and upload speed. I'm going to move it to megabits per second, and we're just going to give it 10 by 10. Then we could select which device. So we could either select a full subnet or we could select one specific device or multiple devices. I'm just going to put it on the 74156 network, and then we'll call it speed limit of 10 by 10. Now you could put this on a schedule as well. So if this is a school system, you might want to have it on a schedule so that they have little internet access during class, but on their lunch break, they could have more internet. That's one use case for this. Now we're quickly going to touch on routing. You already saw how I did the Nord VPN, but if you wanted specific traffic going down your WAN 1 or WAN 2, if you have two ISPs, this is where we would do it. We would create a new entry. We could have all traffic or we could have specific traffic. Under specific traffic, we could do domain, IP, or region. If we do all traffic, everything's going to go through it, and we could select our subnet, or we could select a device. So say I had a VoIP network, and I wanted a dedicated to WAN2. We could do that. So we could click on the network, and then we could click on the interface and select WAN2, and we could just say VoIP to WAN2. Every time a phone is connected to that network, it's not going to go down our primary WAN. It's going to go down our secondary. So this is really great to customize and do policy-based routing. Now we're getting near the end of this video. So we're just going to touch on a few other things. Like if we go over to our system, what we could do here, we have our country, we have our language, and then we have our time format, as well as if you want it light mode, dark mode, or system. And then we have our updates, which we have console and application, which we have to go to the Unify OS. We have our device firmware and we have automatic device updates. I have mine currently turned off, but we could also add a schedule. We have backups where this would just back up the Unify network controller. And then we have advanced. Under advanced, we have Wi-Fi man support, and then we have our interface. They do have a legacy interface, but it doesn't add most of these features. So now we just stick to the new one. If you wanna access the command line interface of your access point or your switch, you need to make sure these debugging tools are on. We also have email services, inform host, and then we have our device authentication. So under the device authentication, if you need to log into one of your access points through something like PuTTY or SSH, this is the username and the password that you would use unless you've already put in SSH keys. Now, speaking about backups, this is where we would back up our full Unify OS as well as our applications. So we would go to console settings, and if you're tied to the Unify cloud, we would have system config backup. We could backup now, which I will do. And you can see a backup was created. This is stored at account.ui.com, but it also downloads a config file for you locally on your computer. Now, if you want to restore, all we do is click restore. And then we could see the console and we could see the backup date. We have a bunch of different save files in there. So you want to select which one you want to go back to. Also, we could back up the whole thing or we could do specific applications. Say I only wanted to do Unify Talk. I could click on Talk, put in my password, and then Restore, and that's only gonna restore the Unify Talk application, 
to the backup date that I selected. Now, a couple other small things. If we want to look at our system log, we do that on the left-hand side. We could see some critical notifications, which my internet went down and I needed a couple things to be adopted. We could also see security detections. Currently, I have no security detections, but this is from our suspicious activity. If you do have something, it will pop up here. We have updates. If we have any updates, we have admin activity. So this is where we could see who logged in when. We also have our client and we could see different descriptions of what is happening. And then we could see different AP triggers, which there was no events. And then we could see our triggers. And this is all based on our firewall rules or our traffic rules. So you could see Mac Telecom UNVR was blocked from accessing 192.168. 10.43 and you could see the rule that was taken that hit now another thing that ubiquity did introduce in this update was their wi-fi insights and we could see our coverage so my ap density is currently good right now i only have one access point in my controller i need to reset the other one and get it back in here but if it's showing that it isn't good that may be an indication that you need to add another ap into your house or into your business another neat feature that ubiquity just introduced was on our topology page we now could show the internet traffic. If I click play, it will do this diagram and it will show us where our traffic is going. So we have my internet going to my UDM SE, going to my UDM Pro, and then the most traffic is going down to this computer. It's probably my computer right now and my MVR. My map looks a little bit messed up because some of my flex switches aren't in this controller yet. Yours should look pretty much correct. The last thing we're gonna talk about is a couple tools that could help you with your home deployment or a business deployment. The first one is Unified Design Center. So this lets us input a design or a floor plan into it and draw in some walls, put access points, put data jacks, as well as cameras. So we could see if we hover over Wi-Fi, what our Wi-Fi is gonna look like. This will give us a good indication on where to put our access points. Now for capacity planning, calculator.ui.com is a great tool. So we could see what these could handle. If we wanted to check out how many cameras the UMVR could handle, we'd click on the UMVR, go to protect, and we could see that it handles 50 HD cameras. If we started putting on 4K cameras, it would shrink the size of the HD cameras that we could put on. So this is a great capacity planner. Now that's gonna be it for this video on the Unify Complete Setup for 2023. And I'm sure I did miss some things. It was a very long video, but we will do updated videos whenever a new network controller comes out or a Unify OS. I'm hoping for Unify Network 2024 video, we see a whole bunch of new gear from Ubiquity, which would be really great to have high availability within our Unify consoles. If you have any questions about this video, please leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you're new here, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. All right, thanks.